blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who writes the law on our hearts, who draws all people together through Jesus. Amen. Held in God's mercy, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Holy God, we confess that we are caught in snares of sin and cannot break free. We pour resources while our neighbors are hungry and cold. We speak in ways that silence others. We are silent when we should speak up. We keep score in our hearts. We let the hurts grow into hatred. For all these things and for sins only you know, forgive us, Lord. Amen. Here is a flood of grace. Out of love for the whole world, God draws near to us breaks every snare of sin, washes away our wrongs, and restores the promise of life through Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. O God, by the passion of your beloved Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.
Our second reading is from Romans 4, beginning at the 13th verse. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wraths, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to, also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses, and was raised for our justification. Here ends the second reading. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel lesson for today. The Gospel for today is the Gospel according to um, Mark, the 8th chapter, beginning with verse 31. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering, and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd of his disciples and said to them, If anyone will become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them, the Son of Man, will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. And the kids come forward at this time. Hey, I'll try to do this. Good, good. <clears throat> Molly's got it going. <laughs> Thanks, Molly. So, I have a banana for everybody. You guys ready? Alright. Banana for you. Banana for you. Banana for you. Banana for you. Don't eat it yet. Hang on to it. Oh, you do the bottom? Oh, so you got the bottom thing? Yeah? I don't think that makes a mess, but that's me. 
So how many of you like bananas? Like them? Okay, good. So how many of you eat the banana with the peeling on? You do that, huh? How does that taste? That tastes good? Yeah, you just eat the banana. You know, I'm, have any of you tried eating a, a, eat a banana peeling? doesn't taste good. Yeah, it's, it's bitter. And the greener they are, the worse they are. So, here's my message for today. Life in Christ is meant to be the banana, the inside. And unfortunately, our lives get covered with a lot of other stuff. Sometimes sinfulness, yes. But resentments, hatreds, and what, what our, our lesson today is, we need to peel that away. Lent is that time where we're talking about peeling away and just focusing in on the grace of God. Okay? So I, I want you to think of that as a way of uh, talking about life. That you want to be right into and eating and savoring the grace of God. In order to do that, sometimes during a journey like this, when we start peeling away some of the other stuff away, get down to the inside of it. Okay? So, life is like the banana. You guys want to repeat that? Life is like a banana. Right. You want to, as it were, be ready to take in Christ. Okay? You guys can go back to places real simple. Oh, I almost forgot. Now, this is another part of that journey, then is peeling away everything and getting to what? The grace of God. So how many of you have your, your sticks? If you want to grab yours, you can see it and choose up one of the strings here, the the uh, ribbons. What, what's the other word I'm looking for? Ribbon's good. Okay. What color do you guys want? You want red? Like this one? Okay. What color do you want? Big a pink one? Anybody? What color do you want? You got one? Okay. That what? That color, this one right here? Perfect. Then you take, are taking this back. What color do you want? You've got a bunch of what color do you want? You want a pink one. Okay. And mom and dad are going to help you tie that, and then you're going to bring it back because after the end of the Lent, we're going to use this for Palm Sunday, right? What color do you want? That's a new color. That just arrived today. Red one? Okay. Very good. Pink. Who is left? What color do you want? Blue? Go. Blue one is for you. Oh, you got a tie already. There's another one for you. What color do you want? that they are recorded. So the events have already taken place, right? 
And now they go back and they are, are writing and recording what has taken place. In other words, the gospel writers have either been a part of the events leading up to the resurrection of Jesus, or they have somehow had an intimate personal relationship with somebody who knew some of the facts that they are writing down. This means that they are working backwards from the resurrection and filling in all the details and the witness of what took place. And that is a life-changing event for them. This life-changing event was something they're recording. So how many of you have a, a Betamax? Anybody have a Betamax? Okay. How about a VHS? Anybody got a, beta, a VHS camera? Still got some of those sitting out? And how about the 8mm? Anybody got some 8mm? I think we got every one of those formats. And unfortunately what happens is oftentimes we've kind of lost the ability to now show the movies that were a part of our family life. But I think this is a time when uh, we're looking back and the writers record this in such a way that we can go back and experience it again. Now this may not seem significant in most cases, but it matters in today's gospel text. I'm going to tell you why a little bit later. We have all heard this story before. Right before this particular text this morning is Peter's great confession. You are the Messiah. Others say you are the Christ. Matthew's Gospel expands a little bit more than that. It says you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But it's what happens next that causes such a steward. Jesus begins to detail what that means and what the future holds. For him and probably for them as well. And Peter is both astonished and a bit uh, dismissive. The word is rebuke. He rebukes Jesus, which means he was very probably socially unacceptable in his remarks. And I don't know what the flowery language sounds like, but I'll bet it was pretty heated. Then comes Jesus' response. And most of us are, again, a bit surprised. Get behind me, Satan. I think it's uh, important to say a couple of things about Jesus' response. First impression is, okay, Jesus, didn't see that one coming. Didn't expect you to say those kinds of words. I thought Jesus was always kind and loving and passionate and patient, etc., 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 and apparently, not so. Jesus gets just as in Peter's face as Peter was in his. The point is that when confronted evil, there seems to be no middle ground here, no middle road. Evil is whatever, in whatever shape it takes, must be dealt with head on. And Jesus is doing exactly that. He's heading evil right in the face and, and talking to him. Secondly, though, Jesus is not calling Peter Satan. As if Peter were a horrid beast from some fiery pit to the bowels of the earth, Satan here is the thought process of any resistance to the truth and the will of God. Like a banana, peeling it is not to be eaten because, or digested, because it's rather disgusting. Okay? It must be resisted, it must be pulled away, it must be discarded. Get behind me. It is an overt declaration of authority. Get behind me implies that evil is not something to be given a future in our lives. A future that belongs to God cannot be shared with that kind of ideas and that kind of thought process. It's this sense of a mindset that Jesus is demanding from Peter if he is to be his follower. For you are putting your mind not on divine things, on human things. I cannot help but wonder how we fare in this regard. Perhaps that is the great challenge of our Lenten journey. Then Mark records the verses about denying ourselves and an invitation to embrace life. Life in the Greek world was not about a pulse, uh, breathing, and mere physical body. But the word implies something about us greater than just the breathing relationships and uh, a mindfulness and a, an emotional health piece to us. It is all of life. What does bring us life? I know that for me, uh, merely living and breathing is not enough. I have been struggling lately because my mother is getting close to the end of her life. In fact, 
To some degree, her life has ended. She is confined to her bed. She has my father by her side, but she has no friends left, no one that she would say she has any important relationship with, other than the phone calls that we make, other than the cards that we send, or the pictures of the grandchildren. The qualified one's existence comes into play, and I can find that I am no longer praying for her, just continuing the breathing peace of what life is about. I can't do that anymore. If Jesus came to give life, this is not what I was taught that he was talking about. Next, we come to the end of the text. What will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? The question asks us to evaluate what and where life is for us. And Jesus makes a strange point. If you are ashamed of me and my words in this crazy, sinful world, I will be ashamed of you. Now being ashamed and shaming are two very different things. Mind you, so why will Jesus be ashamed of us if we are ashamed of him? Again, remember the storytelling uh, teller already knows the end of the story. Mark knows what Jesus did, how he in fact did die, but after three days, how he, God raised him from the dead. What Jesus is anticipating is that the resurrection will be profit, proof positive that putting your trust in him is the path to life. The cross may seem like a path that leads to shame, a wonderful and heartfelt story, but a sham. But already in the story, Jesus is telling and inviting disciples to not lose heart. The victory is coming. Don't be ashamed of me. Wait and see. Victory is just three days away. So listen, if you are ashamed of me, after all the things that I have done, after all the witnesses to uh, what has taken place, those who are healed, those who, who were raised from the dead, in all of these things, then he says, I would do no more than that than to be ashamed of you because I've given you everything I have to give. There is nothing more. Here is the culmination of the gospel then. Are you ready? Even if you are ashamed of me, the shame you will know will come, <clears throat> excuse me, the shame you will know will come when in glory Jesus claims us as his own. Those to whom his suffering uh, was witnessed by them, whose death was witnessed by them, whose cruel death was seen, and then also as he rose again from the dead, they will have seen all of that. His shame will all the more claim us as we realize that God, Jesus not only claims and loves sinners, but claims them as his own. Of this, we will also be witnesses at the end of the ages. So it is that we claim victory of Christ in the midst of our doubts, in the midst of our fears, in the midst of our wondering what life is all about. He has invites us to embrace life, to know life that's beyond life. Blessed be the journey that we are on. And we hold to not the shame of the cross, but the victory of the empty tomb. So we also tell our story, right? Knowing what the ending is, already claiming that victory in Christ. Blessed be our journey then. Hold on. It is going to be epic. Blessings. Amen. At this time, uh, we're going to uh, sing a song if I get my, my team, our team back together and invite you to join also in a beautiful one, uh, the song.
Well, it's a song of the day. It doesn't seem that it's such a bad thing to invite us to rise again, kind of sit for a little bit, and just get up and move around a little bit, you know, stretch out, right? Kind of get your body moving. <coughs>
Your mercy is great. We turn to you for renewal, save lives and ecosystems threatened by pollution and a changing climate. Bless the earth's waters and restore the soil. Preserve rainforests, deserts, and wildlife. The generations to come may cherish your creation. Your so God. Your mercy is great. Your mercy is great. We turn to you for healing. Send compassion and helpers to any who suffer because of war and violence. Shelter unhoused people. Befriend those who are lonely. Bring hope to any in despair. And console the bereaved, especially those we name in the silence of our hearts. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Your mercy is great. Benny. Your mercy is great. Accompany us on our journey, God of grace. Receive the prayers of our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. I invite you to turn and share the peace of Christ with each other at this time. Let us rise and receive our offering. <laughs> Let's offer a prayer. Jesus, you are the bread of life and the host of this meal. Bless these gifts that we have gathered that all people may know your goodness. Feed us not only with this holy food, but with hunger for justice and peace. We pray this in your name. Amen. Let us join in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us 
give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We declare ourselves to be a gathered community in Christ. sad news of our sin and guilt and turn it around through his dying for us and rising for us. Jesus was broken for us and torn apart for us to be healed. He rose from the grave to unleash the life of the world. And he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it. He said to his Friends, take, eat, this is my body.
generous God. At this table, we have tested your immeasurable grace. As grains of wheat are gathered into one bread, now make us one hope to feed the world in the name of Jesus, the bread of life. Rise and receive the blessing. Beloved, we are God's own people, holy, washed, renewed. God bless you and keep you, shower you with grace, fill you with courage, and give you peace. Amen. Let us join in our singing song, Our Lady God.
Go in peace. Share your bread. Thanks be to God.